Well, welcome to the show today, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. My guest is Miriam Zayat, and she is a retail architect based in Lisbon, Portugal. Some of the brands she's worked with in the past include Polo Ralph Lauren, Louis Vuitton, Chanel, and many, many more. She is the co-founder and creative director of M Studio Designs, which is a creative consultancy practice that provides design, branding, and creative strategic thinking solutions to brands in many different countries. Miriam's also a qualified high performance coach certified by the High Performance Academy. In addition to all that, if that's not enough, she also speaks five languages and she's also a mother to a two-year-old girl. So I wanted to bring Miriam on the show to discuss her work with high-end luxury brands, how she set up her own consultancy, and what she's learned during her personal development journey from becoming a high performance coach. So Miriam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So I thought we could maybe just start a bit with your your background, your story. Can you tell me a bit about like where you were born, how you grew up, just a bit about you really? Sure. So um, my name is Miriam, as you know. Um, I was born in Morocco uh, in a city 120 kilometers from, from Casablanca. And um, I was born and raised in Morocco. So basically up to my 21st birthday, um, I moved to France uh, to finish my studies, my architectural studies. And uh, I was um, I was actually studying in Bordeaux. I'm not sure, it's, uh, it's the wine country in France. And I, I like it much. So I, I moved to Paris, I lived in Paris, and then I would move back to Bordeaux twice a week just to take my classes and um, and yeah I mean I grew up in a family um, yeah normal I don't know if you have any specific questions about how I grew up but I think yeah through the through the, the odds of life I think I, I just turned out fine. <laughs> <laughs> what um what was your I guess what's growing up like in Morocco like I, I don't know too much about what it's like there but was it was a pretty normal sort of place to grow up, like? Right. So I think it, it depends. Morocco is a country with a lot of diversity. So you have people in the north will be speaking Arabic. That I mean, the language, the Arabic language, which is the classical one, plus the Moroccan dialect, plus some Berber dialect. And depending on the region, they would speak Spanish in the north and French in the south. So it's kind of very, I would say, um, mixed country in terms of influences and the history of the country at least actually shows that. Um, now, socially speaking, you would have like differences. And I think my luck was that my parents both were working and educated, having a woman, my mother, a woman who was um, a sports teacher at that time was like non-existent. And I think that I, I grew up in a family that had issues, but also with a mix of personalities between my father and my mother. Like that helps me kind of always be independent, not take no for an answer, um, always try and focus on solutions, um, travel alone, like be adventurous, just go. My mother would just send me on holidays like for three months, just, you know, go alone. And I was maybe 13 or 12. Um, so I think I was lucky to have this kind of context. It does exist, but it's not everywhere in Morocco. Sometimes you have people, families that are more conservative, more religious. Um, sometimes you have the other side, like people living like they were living in Europe or, or like a Western country. Um, so I think, I think what I like the most about my upbringing is the fact that I was down to earth because we had issues and you know I can we will talk about that later on but um, but at the same time I had parents that especially a mother that was extremely resourceful and a father that was extremely protective to my freedom as a woman because I had an older brother and in the traditional way the brother will always tell the little sister don't do this don't go out don't wear that and my father was really protective of you do your own life, she does her own life, nobody here needs to tell anyone what to do. So I think in the middle of that, I grew up to be who I am and I'm really grateful for all those experiences and, and for my parents because um, 
only when you get to that age, like 28, 29, 30, I got a baby, uh, I was 29. Um, only at that age you realize, actually, my parents did a great job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, it gives me a good idea. Because you also, you did an Instagram post about some cool stories that your father, about your father from when you were a child. And one of the things you said in that was that he told you, don't let anyone tell you that you're a girl and you can't do it. So it sounds like he was really supportive of you, which would have... Yeah, he was really supportive and he was very open-minded. He was like, a, I think, a modern hippie. Like, he was a hippie living in society, not secluded. So he would just tell me, like, you know, yeah, in that story that you mentioned, he actually also gave me all the drugs and all the alcohols and brought them home and just said, okay, this is how you do, this is how you roll a joint, this is what it is, and this is this drink. And my mother was like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you bringing this at home? <laughs> and, and actually, it was good because since then, I never felt it was interesting to do drugs. I never felt that I needed to smoke or to try drugs, and I never did. So I think... I mean, I'm a firm believer in freedom and independence. So I think that way with my personality works out just fine. So, so I think that was, that was a good move. That's very interesting. Um, that's a cool story. I like that. And I think that's always said so true. When, when something's not like a forbidden fruit, it's, it's like hidden away from you and you kind of see it out in the open, it, you're yeah. less likely to, to go and do it as, as you have done. So. I think that's very smart on his part. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, it was, and I was in an entourage, like all my friends, like they did and got drunk. And I never found that interesting. I don't know if that's the result of my father's intervention. But, uh, but yeah, I still, I never drank, I never smoked, like I never did drugs. So yeah. I'm fine as I am. So. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Cool. Well, so... 2005, you left Morocco to go to Paris, as you said before, and that's where you were for the next eight years. So that was to study, to become a retail architect. Was that the main reason you moved? Um, right. So I was living in Bordeaux and I moved to Paris. And um, the main reason why I moved was really because I had a boyfriend who was living in France. So I was like, okay, I want to go there. I want to be with my boyfriend and so on. And... Um, and I was based in Bordeaux to study architecture, so basically general architecture. And at a point I broke up and I was really feeling bad for a while. Like, I, I think it was the first time that I got really down. Like you sleep, you don't want to eat, you don't want to do anything, you cry all the time and all this stuff. And then I lost a lot of weight well, during that month or a couple of months. So I went to the doctor. And I, I stepped on the, you know, what do you call the thing to weight yourself? The scale? Weight. Yeah, the scale. And I, I was shocked by my weight. It was like the first big, you know, hit, like, oh my God, why are you doing this to yourself? So the next day I was like, okay, I'm done with this. I can't be sad anymore. This is not good what I'm doing to myself. So I went out to find a job and actually I just responded to a couple of, um, posts that were in the universities, like job kind of opportunities. And then I got called by uh, Louis Vuitton, which is the LVMH group, and they wanted to meet. So I went to meet this guy and it wasn't a good profile and I didn't, the interview didn't go well. And then I was like, okay, I'm not getting it. So I went back home and then the HR called me the next day saying, look, it's not a good fit, not because of you, the guy is not okay, but I have another job for you, if you will. Take it. So I go to meet this new team, uh, design team in Paris, and they were amazing. And that's how I stepped into the retail luxury architecture. Actually, I had no idea that existed at that time. Mm, that's so that's um, yeah, my first uh, six months kind of contract. And then it just developed from there, and I stayed in this in this field. That's cool. Yeah. I think it's, it's always interesting as well hearing kind of origin stories of how people get into things because yeah. It's, when you look back at it, like when I look at you now and all these like high-end brands that you've worked with, you start to wonder like, was that deliberate? How did you get into that? But as you just told then, it's just circumstances. Yeah. Sometimes you just see an opportunity, you take it, you refine things as you go along and it kind of just develops in that way. Yeah, which exactly. I think is 
it seems to happen for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I am, I am, I, I trust whatever the universe, the energies, everything around us. I think all your energy speaks for you. And I think the moment I just decided to stop being a victim and just, you know, it's not worth it to hurt yourself for somebody. And you're not here for this. You're not 1,400 kilometers from home to be here, just not eating. You know, it's not worth it. So I was like, okay. And then the moment I shifted that thought in my head, I think everything worked so I could find the right opportunity for me. And even the first interview didn't go well. And I didn't feel like I had to take it because I wanted to find a job. I just felt, no, I don't think we're going to work together fine. So no, it didn't go well. I didn't force myself to respond well to the questions he was asking. I was just very, you know, not into it. And the funny thing is, they didn't reject me. They called me and they said, no, the problem is not you, it's him. I will find you something else. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, when you trust something will happen and you just keep going and, and feel it. So, so yeah, that was a good, a good experience. That's cool. Yeah. So you were, you were working there. Was that for the next eight years? You were kind of working in that space and kind yeah. of your career? Uh, so I worked in uh, retail for a while for LV. I worked for Givenchy. I worked for Berluti, which is a high-end shoe company. Um, I worked for uh, department stores, like the equivalent of, uh, I would say, Harrods in France. Le Printemps and Bon Marché. And then in 2007, my father died. And I was in France and I couldn't go back to Morocco because I didn't have my passport, actually, was with the office who gives me the visa. And I couldn't take it, so I couldn't travel. If I travel, I would be stuck in the other side. So, so my family was like, don't worry, don't come. It's, you know, and, and the worst part was that my family knew he was sick and they didn't tell me. I found out by surprise yeah. and days after he passed out. So that was the second hardship that I went through when I was abroad. Um, so it was like I, I, I kept going, I kept working. And then one day my back got stuck, you know, and I thought, OK, maybe I'm just burying a lot of emotions here and I just need, need to take a break. And that was when I stopped completely to do the architecture and started to do the, um, I started getting yoga certification. I started reading a lot of books about this. And, and somehow I think I was just trying to find something that would make me feel good. And at the same time, help me process all that baggage that I was carrying for years. And, uh, and this method I found, which is called Duro's method, it's um, it's funny because I was a bad student in the practice, but I was a very good student in the theory. So I would go to all the extra kind of um, activities, but I would never go to practice or rarely go to practice because it was painful, you know? I, I didn't want to stay and hold positions. And, um, and then I just realized that it was really whatever we were doing in the practice room had an explanation in the philosophy in the theory and also the scientific side, because I always try to understand what I'm doing in, in all the levels. And even on the religious and theological way inside, everything was really aligned. You would see all the religions, the science, the practice, the theory, the philosophy, everything made sense. So I thought, OK, I will take the course. I want to be a certified um, teacher as well. Mm. Um, so that opened also the other kind of spectrum of my other side of uh, field where I, uh, where I operate. And uh, so that was, so the DeRose method, I guess, can you just quickly explain what that is and I guess right. what you were hoping to get from okay. it? So, so the way it's, it's branded and presented right now is still to me, not the correct one, uh, but if I try to give it um, a definition, it's um, a method that has different kind of like three components. The first comp component is the practical side where you have a lot of yoga pre-classical pre techniques, but that are fully adjusted and adapted to the way we live today. So breathing exercises, um, 
concentration, meditation. Um, some of them you can clean, you know, like some massages to your organs and, and so on. Um, this is one of the parts. And I think that's the way the method is kind of showed today, but it's not just this. The second side is all the concepts behind this. So all the kind of uh, way of living. What is the healthy way of living emotionally? What is the healthy way of living mentally? What is the healthy way of living on your energy? Um, so this goes down to the food you eat, people you are with, the thoughts you feed yourself, um, the emotions you, you choose to, you know, remember and, you know, eat five times a day, whether it's negative or positive, it can be good, it can be bad. And then you have the lifestyle kind of component, which, which encapsulates like both of the two components I talked about. And the lifestyle is what I'm learning on the books and in the practice and with people around me and in the workshops and seminars, am I taking it with me in my life? Am I applying really, when I am getting that email that annoys me, am I responding straight away in the same tone or am I taking time to breathe and try to assimilate that emotion, try to understand the other point of view and then try to deal with it in a more emotionally, I would say, mature way. So to me, this is what Doros Method taught me. Um, and this is what it is, even now when, when I have people asking me for help or for, you know, you know, coaching session, sessions and so on. This is what I what I teach them and what I what I share with them. Um, and I think I think this is the best way I can I can translate it now. It's that it's many components that act on all your uh, levels of body. So you have the physical, the energy, the emotion, the mental, the conscious, and then the subconscious. Uh, and it's amazing. You should try it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we definitely. Um, yeah, because I was talking to to Mauro, the previous guest on the show, and about that as well. And it's it sounds fascinating. All the the yeah. things he was saying about it. So, um, yeah, definitely something for me to look into. About for years, but <laughs> I, no, I mean, you know, you don't feel it in the beginning. Like I was the bad student when I was doing the, the very initial kind of practice. I didn't like it. I was like, this is painful and so on. Mm. But then the moment I added the theory and I went to the advanced one, my life changed. And every day I am so grateful for the rose and everything he did, because I think it's, it's a very powerful tool that needs to be tapped in the right way and unfortunately the the institution needs to tweak some things um but yeah. some people and for example i am working with Mauro to put the curriculum and put the pillars and the categories and try to present it in a more practical way so people would understand fully what it is i'm not sure if you checked it online mm. what did you think of because i would like to have your feedback yeah i think it's from what I've seen, there's no real, it's like you said, it's kind of this ancient practice and all this, if you dig deep enough, all the stuff is really good, but it's almost like you do have to do that digging. No one's, it doesn't really seem like anyone's kind of packaged it up in a way that's just, here's these things that, that can help you in modern life. It's, you kind of have to do the digging and find it all out yourself. Yes. I and it's good. Thank you for your feedback because that's how I feel it and how I see it. Like you can't show a yoga poster and tell people this is going to change your life because the person will directly associate it with the yoga that people do to be zen, and they will not understand. And it's funny because when I went last year to Brandon Burchard's um, High Performance Academy, all the techniques that he asks us to do, the breathing ones, the physical ones. All of that is, is exactly what we do, and we have many more techniques. Mm -hmm. But the way he branded those techniques and named them is completely different. So it appeals and makes sense to the major overachiever person that would do the high performance trainings, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we're working on, on fixing that, Mauro and I. That's cool. For it's always a. Sorry? Say again, sir. No, I want, just wanted to say for, for people who are watching that don't know who's Mauro, it's my husband. And he was also a guest on the show. <laughs> yeah. so you can go back and listen to, to, to that one. Um, yeah, I think it, it's funny because it is, I think there's a lot of things like that. We can always get 
a lot of the stuff that's put out today, a lot of the content, as you said, like whether it's like Brendan Bouchard or any of these kind of people, usually it, it's based on something that already exists. And we see a lot of like the traditional like self-help stuff these days is a lot of it's based on like Jim Rohn or some of these other guys back back in the day. And everyone kind of just repackages and remarkets in their own way. And, and I think like that needs to be done because people, there's so much, it's hard to get people's attention these days. So you need to be able to package these things in ways that people understand quickly. Yeah. And so it's a and, good and, project. And what I told Mauro is like most of the coaching certifications and, and courses and talks, they talk, they give you the mind and the information which you will process in your head, but nobody gives you the base that will prepare your body, emotions, energy, conscious level, subconscious level to make sure those concepts stay and stick and that you are evolving in the right direction in all the levels. And that's why I told him our product is extremely unique because we have both, we have everything. Mm. So, so yeah. yeah. So what did you, why did you want to become certified as a high performance coach? Was that just your own need really? I, I am, I am a constant learner. I mean, you have no idea how many things I did. Uh, I tried to streamline the main ones, but I first I like to learn from the best people. Uh, second, I like to surround myself by people who have the same growth mindset. Um, and I do believe that our education doesn't stop with university or school. Nobody ever, ever says the moment you find a job, you stop learning. Because that's stupid, I think. So, I mean, you have to keep going and you have to find what will keep you, keep your brain working, even if it's just brushing your teeth with the other hand every day and trying to do things like if you're driving to work this way, take another way, just do something that will keep your brain kind of, you know, working and growing and your neurons wiring. But I have this constant need to learn things. Like I read, like now I'm reading three books at the same time. I am doing two courses online. I love to work, to learn from everybody. I love to, um, it's like the line of learning that I have is like I start from one point and then whenever I see something is needed, I go and find it and do it. And then whenever, you know, and it's like a tree, you never finish. You just start and then you're like, okay, so if I'm doing yoga and philosophy, I need to know the science behind it. So I went to Joe Dispenza's books and learnings. If I'm doing the science of it, I need to understand if this is, why is the religion so trendy sometimes? So I went to the religions and I understood the practices of the religion. And everything actually is aligned. It's just that nowadays we love to make small groups and argue that my thing is better than yours, rather than saying all together is the richness. Um, so I studied that and then I thought, okay, so how would you actually apply all this in a practical way? So I went to Brandon Bouchard, you know, and now I am doing some other courses on, on the brain and the memory and how the memory works and all these things, which is what I'm doing currently. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I, I just think I'm a con like a forever learner. I mean, I will be at 95 years old and you will tell me, Miriam, what are you doing? I'll tell you, I'm learning something new. <laughs> yeah. well, that's great. That's the best trait you can have, really, to be a forever student because yeah. growth is what we, growth is happiness, really. If you're, yeah. if you're not growing, you're dying. <laughs> so. For sure. And it doesn't have to be something like complicated. It can be taking classes of another language online, a language that you like. It can be taking cooking lessons. It can be learning how to do like calligraphy but it's always good to find something new to learn like every year find something that you love or you don't love you're just curious about and just go behind it mm. couldn't agree more so 2011 you moved to portugal yes. and that was <laughs> Everyone thought you were crazy for doing that. So can you maybe just explain why people thought that was a crazy move and then why you actually did it? Yeah, sure. So I'm in Paris. 
I have my own my house, my life, my job, my salary, my routine, everything. Um, and then I decide, okay. Um, oh no, actually I met with Mauro in 2008, but we were friends. And then we started being together in 2010, in the end of 2010. And then I was like, okay, we're doing this, this long distance relation for four months. I don't want to do it. And then it was be between him coming to me or me coming to him. It's going to sound very uh, superficial, but I literally moved here for the sunshine. <laughs> I, I, I get that. I didn't think about anything else. I didn't think about job. I didn't think about the economy. I didn't think about anything. I just thought, OK, I'm tired of the gray weather. I'm going to Portugal. That's it, like, ciao. So of course, my, my friends were crazy. My teacher back then uh, of the certification told me it's a big mistake. My mother freaked out. She was like, she, actually, I didn't tell her until I was on the way back from France to Portugal with my stuff. That's when I told her I told because I, I developed this thing with my parents. I never ask for permission. I always make my plan, do my thing and then tell them this is happening and that's it, you know. So sometimes it gets me into trouble with them, but but overall I think it was a good training. Um, yeah, so I came here. I love the life. I love the weather. I love being with Mauro in his like kind of world. And I also love to move. Like every four years, I would just go somewhere. So it made sense. Um, it was a pretty, it was a pretty hard economic time in Portugal. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, it was. But then again, if you're resourceful, you'll make it work. If you're a victim, you'll whine and say, "Oh, I'm not na na na. I can't find a job because of the economy." So. I came here and then we that's when we opened M Studio because I was finding clients in Brazil and I was doing design works um, for them. Mm. With, um, so I found the job. I mean, I built my own company here and uh, I mean, I I always make it work. You know, I, I come from from mentality of like, yes, things happen, good or bad. When bad things happen, take time to assimilate and digest. Don't take two months. Take a little bit less time, you know, like <laughs> to digest. And if you need help to digest things, that's fine. Go find somebody to help you. But the point is, if something bad happens, try to assimilate fully, try to digest it. And once you're in peace with whatever happens, just keep going. There is always a solution. There is always a way. I mean, today is Martin Luther King's day and he said, Darkness doesn't solve darkness, only light solves darkness. So there is always a way and that's what I always tell people. I mean, my friends know if they come to me with a problem, I'll just point out the solution and that's it. <laughs> and, and sometimes I seem hard on people because if you come to me sad and I will not be very nice about it, I would just say, come on, why are you talking about something else as the reason why you're like this? If you are like this, it's because of you. End of talk. So what can you do to move on? You need to have a plan. I will take time off. I'll go see like a coach or psychotherapeut or something. And then in three months, this is what I'm going to do and just stand for it and do it. So, um, so yeah, I moved to Portugal. Everybody said no. I love when everybody tells me no because I can show them yes. <laughs> and uh, and this was really amazing. I loved it. We would go to the beach in the morning before uh, starting to work. It was sunny up to November. It was amazing. We would go out, we'd meet with friends. We still had work. He still had the coaching and, and the sessions he was giving. So it was it was really good. And then we got married in 2012. That's awesome. So you yeah. mentioned um your business M Studio Design. So, um, yeah, would you be able to tell me a bit about that? Like, what what M Studio Design is? Why did you start it? How do you help people? Right. So we have it. many phases. So the first phase was when we opened. We were in Portugal, same building, the apartment facing this office. Actually, that's where we were living. Um, 
And it just came out of, okay, this is what I do. And actually the reason why I opened my company and didn't find a job is because the salaries in Portugal were extremely low. And back then I was um, 27, I guess, 26 or 27, I think 27. Um, back then I, I, um, I applied and, they were, and everybody was like, oh, you're a junior. And if you want to work, it's going to be like 700 euros. And I'm like, come on. I mean, this is not even, this is nothing. A month you know? or a week? A or? month. Really? <laughs> yeah. They would base that I'm junior based on my age. They wouldn't see your experience. They would just see your age and, and define, okay, to be senior, it needs to be maybe 50 in Portugal. So I said, no, I'm not going to take this just because I need a job. We're going to find a way. And that's when we found the dance studio. So we were uh, doing uh, works and kind of uh, design uh, projects for uh, projects in Brazil. And then um, we were doing that up to 2012. And then in 2012, I, I guess pregnant. So in the end, after I think six months or five months, I didn't want to work anymore because I just wanted to enjoy pregnancy. And I had already lowered the, uh, the, the workload. And I think when I got pregnant, now I remember, uh, we were negotiating to move to China <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, for consultancy for Dior, actually, for Dior in, in Shanghai. Mm. Uh, and then I found out I was pregnant, plan changed, um, I would use the work, Mauro kept working, um, the baby was born in 2013, and then with the motherhood, then the life, my life and my reality changed completely because I wanted to be with Yasmin. I wanted, you know, I wanted both of us to educate the kid and grow with the kid. I was not going to put her in daycare or anything, but then not working for a while is not okay. Of course, financially it was getting a bit hard. So we thought, okay, let's see if we want to go somewhere else. Let's, because Portugal wouldn't offer us at that, in that context, what we wanted, we were like, let's see if we can find something else. And then I got this offer in an agency in Amsterdam. So we moved to Amsterdam. I worked in this agency um, for a year, I guess. And then I just felt like, no, this is not working. And then I got back to my company, which didn't close. It, it kept working, but at a very, very slow pace. So. Went back to M Studio. Um, I didn't. Is it even... just you at this point, or there was one other person? No, it was just me at this stage. Okay. Uh, with Mauro, of course, but yeah. it was just me. You know that Mauro is a graphic designer, right? Mm. Okay. So, um, so then we we said, okay. I said I'm gonna stop, and then we're gonna see what will happen. And then I didn't do any business development. It's just people started referring me to the other. And then that's how I got clients. And that's where I am today. Every client I have is just a referral from somebody. Um, best way to get clients, that's great. Yeah, it's a great way because then you, my reputation is, you know, my CV. Mm. So, so it's funny because many people that recommend me, they tell the person like, I didn't work much with her, but I know she's a great person and what she says she delivers. And that's how, that's what people like about me. It's like, we know you're very straightforward, so we don't have surprises with you. Um, and I'm very, very happy because we grew very fast and, and we're doubling, you know, the revenue and we have the team members, you know, remote team members. And, uh, and yeah, so, uh, so I think from 2000 and, so it's been the company after leaving the job in Amsterdam until now, it's been like four years. Mm. So awesome. And what, yeah. what's the, what are the main sort of projects you're working on? Which right. So we have, okay. So we have two categories. The first one is uh, design and, and like creating luxury brand concepts, which means studying the brand, distilling the, the essence of the brand, and then from that essence, extracting one idea that will be then developed into the branding, the retail stores, the communication, the marketing and everything. 
And then the other pillar of the company is uh, store development, where brands already have their concepts, but they want to um, develop it in, in a region. So basically, I would do um, offers for uh, projects from real estate negotiations to get the space up to opening the building that is already built and deliver and deliver everything. So these are the two kind of main, I would say, pillars that we work with. Sounds like a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It's a lot of people, but it's it's very. I mean, I don't look like a person who likes little, so I I like, yeah. <laughs> I like a lot of work. So, so that's yeah, good. It sounds, and it sounds like you do a lot of traveling for the the yeah. business because you've obviously got clients in different countries. You mentioned Brazil, yeah. and I'm sure all over Europe. So <laughs> you're still you're still on the road a lot at the moment, are you? Yeah. Well, I am. And that's the only thing that I would change this year because last couple of years I was traveling practically every every week, sometimes twice a week. Um, and I think it's it's good, but it's not uh, it's not how I want to continue. It was good while while it lasted, and now I feel this year I need more um, being more in the office. I will still travel. I will still have periods of busyness, but I will try and be minimalistic on the travel uh, because I would like to launch other projects and I'm thinking about other things so I need to be you know settled and have my creative space and creative flow and traveling doesn't help much because um, you know first of all traveling sleeping away not eating well you know having dinners with colleagues and all these things um, doesn't help and the other thing is I don't want to feel which was the feeling I got from last year I don't want to feel that my life is punctuated by traveling. So basically, if you tell me, Miriam, what are you doing in April? Do you want to do X, Y, Z? I will tell you, wait, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going there, I'm going there. No, it doesn't work. It has to be July. So I felt like I'd come home and then I'm getting ready for the next one. As opposed to what I want to do, which I did before, is come home stay for a couple of weeks and then travel, come home, stay for 10 days and then travel so I can resource myself and, you know, refill my energy level. Mm, absolutely. And yeah. I imagine it would be harder as well with your daughter traveling often as well, having to. Yeah. Her. Yeah. She's, she gets used to it. She likes it. Actually, when you ask her what you want to do, she's like, like you travel, go to restaurants and design buildings. And it's funny when you say these things because it's it's funny how how little ones they they take the example. But um, it's hard. It was hard emotionally a couple of years ago. I would feel bad to travel and leave Yasmin with Mauron. Um, but then I realized I have an example to set, and the example I set is you need to be independent. You need to be free. As long as you like what you do, just do it. So I started turning this into excitement rather than oh, I'm still traveling again. And that was like two years ago. So for these two years, that's why I traveled a lot, because I wanted to and I, I set up that standard of like, OK. But then this year, I feel my intuition kind of tells me I need to just develop new things that have been sleeping for a while. So I am working in new projects and I have to be there to develop them. So the aim is or the tra travel this year. Makes sense. Can you talk about any of those projects or are they still kind of... Uh, kind of I think if you like big lines, just hold on a second. Mm -hmm. I forgot to plug my computer. Oh yeah, good for, for <laughs> I don't want to lose it. <laughs> That's typically me. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be very curious to hear huh? what you're up. I'd be very curious to hear what, you're, what you've got in the pipeline. Of course. There you go. Good. So I'll give you like the big lines. So you know how I told you now I've been talking about um, having everything aligned, your, all your levels and everything and systemize, like put in a system and a structure to everything we do and we teach. So my biggest goal is to build kind of a school that makes humans become superhumans. Because 
Unfortunately, and I don't know where this is coming from, but yoga and the techniques are labeled as, um, you know, if you go to yoga class, you just see people that are, whether depressed or not happy or lost. And it's a pity that this treasure is not known mainstream, that if you are an overachiever, if you're an athlete, if you're an active mother that have three kids and doesn't have energy and you want more energy, if you're a lifestyle junkie, you love to feel better and be good and learn good things for your lifestyle and, and live by those things. And if you are, for example, a creative that gets to a dead end and needs constant creation and, you know, these are the kind of techniques and this is the, the kind of keys and, and things that you can use to make your life get to the next level. So. I told Mauro we need to be serious about this right now because I feel this is the moment um, because we all need this. I mean, you need it, I need this, Mauro needs this. And, and I always told Mauro, my best client is myself. So what do I like? So I like design and I like uh, conscious living. I like organic lifestyle. I, okay, I would like to build a structure that reflects all these things because I know there are a lot of people like me that would love to have something like this. So this is the big one. Um, the second one is uh, I'm writing a Moroccan vegetarian cookbook. <laughs> oh. Because Arabic books are always meaty and there is no Arabic vegetarian lifestyle book. So I'm working on that and it's more focused on spices and the aim is to launch a spice brand uh, where I would show people how to use spices and the benefits of spices because when I moved to Europe, people use wrong spices when they cook Moroccan food. <laughs> so I kind of had this idea like to make these packs and the pack is not mixed already. So the person has the dose of each one and so teaching people remotely by a product. Um, so this is kind of the second uh, kind of project for me. It's cool. Yeah. I like, I like the sound of that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, I, and the first one is also coming from a place where I've been traveling so much that I feel a little bit far from Mauro. I'm like, okay, let's do something together because I like to work with you closely. So this came up. What do you think of the idea? Yeah, I love it. Are you going to be shipping to Australia? <laughs> I will, for sure. I will maybe bring it to Australia because I need to visit right. Australia. <laughs> Absolutely. Definitely let me know when, when you come. And it'd yeah. be good if you could bring some spices with you. <laughs> well, sure. If they let me bring them in, because I heard yes. Australian borders are really difficult, no? Yes, they are extremely strict, which is <laughs> interesting. I mean, how I guess it, it's good. How is it like to live there? I mean, for me, it's like far. It's very far. Mm, yeah, I would definitely say that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fantastic place. It's a great place to live. Like, weather's good people are good it's it's a nice place but as you said it's just so far from everything yeah. um, which is good and bad in a way because you do feel quite isolated from whenever there's like big problems in the oh, world yeah. you feel quite isolated from it like you feel like you don't have to it doesn't seem to affect us as much here i think it's great yeah and if you like nature you'll definitely oh. like australia because there's lots of nature <laughs> I, I I have okay. So a friend from the US tried to move to Sydney, but she had some issues with her uh, visa, and she had to move back to the US. And one of the designers we worked with before is now in Melbourne. She lives in Australia, and oh, she's that's where I am. Yeah, and I would love to go there actually because it's fascinating for me first to be in that side of the world, and second, I think it's a complete different kind of reality, and you're much ahead in terms of lifestyle and conscious living and all these things. You're, I feel you're like much ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's, yeah, possibly. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely an awesome place to, to live and visit. So definitely make sure you let me know when you come and I'll okay. be able to recommend some places. Thank you. But um, yeah, and one, one thing you mentioned as well about this one of these projects with the setting up this kind of education system for conscious living and lifestyle. Yeah. What's, what do you think is the problem with 
the education system today for like the mainstream yeah. public right so this will it's a contradiction for me because i came from mainstream education i went to french school i loved french school um, i loved the competitivity i loved all of it um, but then today from that time until now things have evolved technology have evolved has evolved um, we are facing different problems um, the jobs are no longer be the same in 10 years probably most of the desk jobs will be gone uh, we see a growth in the in the freelancing kind of world people are working and creating companies and startups so we are shifting from the model where you just have to sit and listen and do your eight hours a day and just leave. And unfortunately, the education is still like that. So I remember when we we got Yasmin uh, in 2016 or 17, I don't remember, we got her into French school. And I was excited because the structure is amazing. The building is amazing. Uh, it's worldwide, so we thought if she goes to French school, then if we travel and move, we're not going to have problems putting her in another school. And then she would come home and frustrated, like it's like you unleashed, you unleashed a beast. Like she's quite mature and quite okay, she's calm, she's energetic, but still she knows what she wants and how to do it. But when she was in those three months in the French school, it was hor horrible for us because she would come back and say, why am I sitting all the day? Why during the break these guys are playing war? Why are they insulting me and calling me bad names? I wouldn't mention it, but they called her names. And then I went to talk with the, the, the school teachers and they would say, oh, it's kids, it's normal. I'm like, what do you mean normal? I am educating my kid at home and I'm sending it to you to delete everything I'm teaching her at home. So if you want me to tell her to respond to violence by violence, I will do it. And it's going to be it's not going to be nice because she can just beat them all. And so this was the first thing. The second thing is when she was saying, like, why do I have to repeat things every single day? She was excited in the first week. Second week, she's like, why am I doing the same? And why there isn't any green space here? And why is the teacher punishing me because I asked a question in the middle of a book reading? So, I think that worked before to educate people to just listen and shut up, which is preparing you to cover a job. But right now, I mean, we have technology. I mean, we are, I think, the last generation that didn't live with technology. But from our generation on, they don't know what's living without a cell phone or a computer. They don't know. Um, so, I think school today needs to teach them life doesn't need to teach them how to write or how to count because it's useful, but maybe not to the extent where we go. We don't need to, to know a big equation, but maybe we need to know how to grow our own food, how to organize our finances, how to learn something like with your hand, like how to make clothes, how to do things, you know, because that's what kids want to learn. And that's, those are the kind of skills that will serve them in the future. So I'm not saying you need to switch from zero to 180, but I'm see, saying we need to introduce some of the alternative techniques. They need to go to nature. I mean, I'm not sure if you heard or read about it, but the kids, our kids, so the millennials, the kids of millennials will be better than the generation that is like 10 years older than us, just because the 10 years older than us, they kept the kids at home, school, driving, overprotecting, not going to nature, eating a lot of bad refined food. And they are now seeing there are problems of obesity, diabetes, uh, depression in kids, hyperactivity, all these things. This is coming from the lifestyle and education. It's not coming from kids. I mean, I mean, a kid needs to be outside. They need to get dirty, they need to play together, they need to play with animals, they need to be in nature, and they need to learn things practical, because with the practical things, they will learn how to behave in life and how to be citizens and care for their planet and, and the humans around them. So I've seen I've seen a couple of options. In Portugal, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of these options, but in the Netherlands, they have a lot. 
And last week I was researching and WeWorks actually, they created the school model, which is WeGrow. Mm. And they do exactly what I'm talking about. And I, I applied, even knowing that they don't have anything in Europe. And I just sent them an email saying, if you need a partner in Europe, please let us know because we would love to help you develop this in Europe, you know. Yeah. So that's my idea. Um, maybe some kids, they need more structure and more of a, a traditional way of education, definitely. But those kids also need to learn and go out in a different way and go to, to nature and go to the beach and go hike and do some humanitarian kind of work, you know. Because I think I think we're creating monsters if we continue doing what we're doing. We're creating individualistic, self-centered people mm. in context that will no longer need this. The world is shifting towards other values, and mm -hmm. it needs to to go along with these values. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what I couldn't agree more with everything you said. It's definitely outdated the education system. Uh, there's so many things that I've learned at school that are just yeah. <laughs> thinking back. I'm like, why did I learn that and missed out on so many things? And burnout. I mean, there are kids burned out. You realize that just from assignments and homework and stress and be on time and oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. relevant. And I'm curious how you, as someone who has a young daughter who's sort of at that age of going through school, how do you handle that because as you said there's not really options that exist like this ideal situation that you're thinking of having a part in creating yeah. so what are you what are you actually doing with her well, the first thing was that we decided she wouldn't go to daycare she would stay with us travel with us work with us many times i would be in the office having conf call and she would be there listening with me just you know so that's the first thing the second thing we never we never teach her fear. So we teach her to be safe, but we would never tell her, don't get the scissors, you will hurt yourself. So what we did is like, we would monitor her, she would get the scissors, the grown up scissors, she would want to learn to cut, we would be with her there, just making sure she doesn't hurt herself. But we're more into teaching them to do the things rather than telling them not to do them because they're going to get hurt. Mm. For example, we would be cooking. She learned how to, um, how do you say, remove the skin of potatoes? Uh, peel? Yeah, how to peel vegetables. She learned that since she was two. She would get like into a chair and then just cook with us. She learned how to cook all the vegetables raw and she still goes to the market and takes like a mushroom and just eats this like this, you know? We, we were just saying, okay, we're raising a human being. She needs to be treated as a human being. We never talk with her as a baby talk. Um, we were very present. And that's why when I was there, Mauro could go do something else. And then when he's away, then we got a nanny part time just so we can do our stuff. But we were really always there. That was the first step. The second step was we would still go on play dates with kids, but that would be like a couple of hours or so. Um, she started school in the Netherlands when she was two and a half because it's they have this uh, kindergarten for like two hours in the morning. Um, I didn't like it much. I removed her from the school, stay home. We moved back to this one thing. Um, we tried the French school, didn't go well, and now we are having her attend the Waldorf High School Method School with a couple of mix of methods. It's not the perfect scheme, but at least it has a positive attitude. They learn through doing things. So for instance, last Friday they had a burger shop open. So each one had a task and they made the, 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 the banknotes and the coins, they wrote the numbers and that's how they would learn to count. Like, okay, I give you 10, how many do you need to give me? But in a context where they had real food, they had to serve the teachers, they had to count the money, you know, all these things. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great. And um, 
So yeah, I'm not happy with certain aspects of this school because she's vegetarian and sometimes the teacher, they comment with her that she, maybe the food is not enough what she's eating because she's vegetarian, blah, blah, blah. But overall, I think it's the best scenario that we can have right now until we decide what we're doing next in the next step. And I do see the difference in her. She, for example, if I say, oh, we forgot to buy this, she would directly jump in and say, don't worry, mom, maybe we can do X, Y, Z instead of this and that. So she has now the mindset of, I don't have to get stuck into the problem. I have to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the best school that we find now that goes along with how we are with her at home. And, uh, and yeah, we just teach her to be independent. But if she's scared or fearful of something, we are there to make her feel safe. Uh, and just really, I mean, it's so easy if you follow your gut and not follow what the system tells you. It's so straightforward. So whoever has a kid and feels the struggle between doing this or that, just follow your gut. And for active parents that cannot be at home with the kids, just try and find, you know, the best, the good school with the good teachers or a nanny that could help you until you find that school or maybe a family member that can be there for you when you need. Um, but just don't throw your kid at the first option just because you don't have a choice because you do have a choice always. Absolutely. And yeah. it's such an important decision, I guess, because it's oh, yeah. such an impressionable age <laughs> oh. that if you put them in the wrong environment, it's just you see it in people. They they get messed up for the rest of their life. So, exactly. yeah, you got to be exactly. you got to be deliberate. And yeah. one of the things that you said about parenting which i really liked was show them don't tell them so okay. can you unpack that a little bit just explain what that means right so the day i wrote about that it was a day where we were back in lisbon and when we were in netherlands she would sleep with us she had her bed besides our bed but then when we came back it was the first time that she would get to her, her room and the first night she slept in her room the next day she came to our bedroom but she didn't open the door she knocked on the door and she waited. And then I was like, this is interesting. I've never asked her to knock on the door, but she did it because when I go to her room, that's what I do. And when she is in a private space and I go there, I don't just, she's a kid, yes, but kid needs respect. I wouldn't do to her something that I wouldn't like her to do back to me. Um, so show them, don't tell them. Um, for example, eating healthy. You know what's my daughter's favorite food? Broccoli and celery. <laughs> that's, what, that's her favorite food, you know? <laughs> she doesn't like to drink food a lot. Of course, we would give her pizza and she loves pasta and she loves cookies and she loves ice cream. But she's understanding that everything has to come into a balance because she sees us eating healthy. She sees us put in a lot of veggies. She sees us, for example, I eat a lot of celery. I juice a lot of celery every day. She loves it because that's the example she has. I don't need to tell her, like if I lecture her, like, no, don't eat this because X, Y, Z, na, 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 and I scream with her. It doesn't, it won't work. Because kids, kids brain operates on a, on a theta kind of frequency between zero and seven. So between zero and seven, they assimilate. They don't listen. They just assimilate through experience and through doing the things. And they would also get impressed by what you would tell them if it's negative or if it's positive. But I, I think that learning is, is much more efficient when it's done by example and done by inclusion. Like come here, let's cook together. Like when we go to the supermarket, since always she would take her own, uh, you know, uh, basket and she would just go everywhere she knows what she likes what she wants and then we would go all to the register and we would pay for everything and she never would bring me only junk food she would come and say we don't have any more of these should we take the cookies chocolate or the i don't know the nuts ones you know and and i think it's a pure reflection of how we 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 live so I don't need to lecture her. I don't need to force her to do things. I need to listen to her if she wants to do something different because we're not all equal. And she's not my property. She's a human being that I put in earth, but she will have her own life. So I need to give her the benefit of 
you know, having the critical kind of thinking and analysis. Um, and I think all the all the studies have shown that when you involve somebody into something to do, the person will never forget. As opposed of sitting again back to school, sitting and listening for hours to the teacher, I think you will only get two percent of that, not even five percent of what you're what you're listening to. So yeah, show them, involve them. You can tell them, but just keep in mind that showing and involving is much more powerful. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that because I think you see so many. A lot of parents are completely hypocritical. They'll say one thing to their kids and then they're acting in the complete opposite way and oh, yeah. then they're wondering why <laughs> it's not working out. So uh, no, definitely. I don't know what she. I, I, I don't remember, but one day I told her something. I don't remember. And then she looked at me and she said, no. And I said, why? She said, well, because we don't do this. We don't do these things this way. So I will not do it this way. And I'm like, it's true. I don't do it that way. Why am I asking her to do it the opposite way? But it's funny when you start responding to you with your own, you know, <laughs> principles. Yeah. And, start, and look, nobody's perfect and nobody's a perfect parent. But you will always have to stay to stay stay through, no, stay true to yourself and to what you teach them to the point where if you fail sometime and your kid points out that you're doing something the opposite way than what you taught them or told them, just say yes, you're right. Thank you for correcting me, and that's it. You know, we're we're not supposed to be perfect to them. We're supposed to be compassionate and loving and be there for them, making them feel safe. But just the family is growing together, including the kid. You're not up there and the kid here. No, you're all the same and just going together. So, uh, so yeah, again, we just have to keep doing our best. And when we can do our best, that's OK. But just trying is good. That's awesome. I love that. It's a great message. Thank well, you. sort of coming up on the tail end of the interview here, but just a few more quick questions. Yeah, I'm curious. You kind of already told us a bit about what you're you're getting up to in this next year, but what's what's your vision of the future? Like what are you what are you working towards? What do you see the future as? What's your vision? Honestly, I'm working towards impacting as many people as I can. I think that we are all born with a gift. I think that we are you know, we're we're different for a reason. So you have your gifts. I have my gifts. Everybody has his gifts. And I think I'm so lucky to come from Morocco because I grew up with a sense of community where if we have neighbors and I need salt, I can go to the neighbor and get salt. If the neighbor needs carrots, I would give them carrots. And when we have celebrations every morning, of celebration, you take sweets, you take anything like a cake or anything you prepare, then give them and they give you back. If you have your family visiting and you don't have enough space at home, your neighbors will open that, their home to your family. And that's how I grew up. So Maru thinks sometimes I'm crazy because whoever needs a home or something, I'm like, yeah, come on in, we have a guest room, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And he is right in some instances because I should be careful. Uh, if I'm like that, doesn't mean that everybody uh, is like that. So I need to filter sometimes. Um, but my vision would be to live in a world where all the values are shifted. We're not living as individuals, but we're living as community where humans are lifting each other. Like if I have a power and you need me to empower you, I will be there for you too, so you can I can bring you up. And I love this quote, which is, we rise by lifting the others. Because that's true. I mean, you mm -hmm. can't, I mean, I'm not sure, but in Europe, there is a lot of individuality. In Paris, there was a lot. In Lisbon, there isn't, but there is. It depends on where you are. And I think we need to get back to living together. We need to get back to trusting each other. We need to get back to trusting ourselves to making sure we we are taking care of ourselves, of our body, of our emotions. Because if we're good, it reflects on our entourage. And actually, there is a book that you should read called mm -hmm. 
I'll send you, I'll, I'll text you or I'll send you the, the cover. But it's called Letting Go. Mm. I don't know if you heard of that book. I've heard of it, I haven't read it. Right. And it's, it's purely about frequencies and energy, but he also says, like, let's say I wake up in the morning, it's beautiful outside. I put on the music that I love. I meditate. I eat. I am with my loved ones. And then I go out. Do you think I'm going to impact the other, the rest of the day positively? And the rest of people I will meet positively? Yes. So imagine if everybody is on the same vibe. No stress. No burnout. No boss that is making your life hell. No husband that is abusive. No stress that you need to get the kid dressed because you need to run to work. Imagine you just wake up in peace and peaceful with yourself and just go and impact the world positively. And actually, this is the idea that I would like to link to the projects we're working on, because that's the aim of this project, is making you feel good, giving you superpowers, so you're perfectly aligned on all levels that you can achieve anything with grace and ease because nobody needs to struggle to get things everything is easy but we may actually we make it difficult i don't know if you ever thought of this principle but most of things we worry about never happen and we love to focus sometimes on the problem it's not it's not helping us it's not serving us and it's not serving our health or anything so my vision is to impact as many people as i can with my ideas with the work that I'm developing with Mauro, uh, hopefully the team will grow and everything will flourish and it will be possible. And I think that towards the evolution of the workplace and everybody will be remote, remotely working, spaces like this are key to the community. To, to like, it's like, I see it as an equalizer. You know when you have a lot of sounds and you want to make them look good? So you have a lot of vibes and different energies and you just want something to align them, to give them more power. So that's my big vision. I love it. I love it. It's a big, it's a big vision and I'm sure you're judging by your past. You yeah. don't let anyone say no, so I'm, I'm sure you'll definitely get yeah. to there. I'm just writing down that I need to send you the book. And, yeah, uh, and there, is a, there is a video. Do you know Jason Silva? No. Okay, I'll send you a video of this guy and you will love it. Okay. And actually, whenever I see this video for the last three years, I tear up because it's such a powerful message. And basically, he says that when we look at Earth from the moon, we see one Earth. We don't see countries. We don't see borders. We don't see houses. We don't see different families. You see Earth. So imagine if we remove the borders and we just live globally and, and go from this message of helping each other. How would Earth be and how would humanity evolve? I will send you that after, after our, our chat. Do. And I'll link that book and that video in the show notes so everyone can see that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, is there anything that I haven't asked you or anything that you really want to make sure that you share with the audience before we finish up here? Um, no, I think I've shared everything that I have at heart and uh, I would like to thank you for doing this. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It was a really, yeah, really insightful interview. So well, what's the best way for people to connect with you, Miriam, if people want to follow um, you or see what you're up to? What's the best way? I think I'm on Instagram. I'll, I post stories and so on. I'm not that good with posts, but uh, next year I need to get better at that. Um, and and on there I will be announcing the platforms where I can be found and all the things we will be, you know, developing in the future. But mm -hmm. I would say Instagram is the best place to find me and look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll link that up. And just for the people listening, what's what's your handle on Instagram? It's Mary Zibex. Mary Zibex, I would say. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure I link that up and. Yeah, this is an awesome interview. You're, you're a very interesting person, Miriam, so I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts. I have a question for you. When are you coming yeah. to Lisbon? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to, so 
I don't have an exact date, but um, yeah, I really want to come because I've obviously known your your husband Mauro for a while now, so I always see what he's up to in sunny Lisbon. It looks like an awesome place. So maybe when when it's the middle of winter over here and it'll be summer over there, I think I'll come then. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to stay with us, and I mean it. It's not that Mauro is gonna say careful, like you know, you can't. <laughs> But actually, I was asking him, like, is he coming over to Lisbon or should we go to Australia? This is a good excuse to go over there. So, <laughs> yeah, um, good excuse for us to do it yeah, traveling. Exactly. And, uh, and I mentioned to, to Mauro this as well. I told him, I find you very, I mean, con congratulations for your discipline and for your, um, what's the word in English? For your perseverance, it's perseverance. Oh, yeah. Persistence. Persistence. Persistence, yeah, because you are getting out there, doing the things, you know, and I really admire that. So you are doing great and thank you very much for everything you're doing. Keep going. I really appreciate that. Well, yeah, thanks again for your time and, and thanks okay. everyone for tuning in today. This is a really interesting interview and um, yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you.